if I want to solve the equation, I don't know if we did this one yesterday or not, but I'm gonna do it again. Let's say I want to solve the equation. I'm not sure. Secant of x equal to negative one half. Well, again, I'm not so great with secant. I'd much rather use the reciprocal. Oh, and I should also point out, right? We are solving this for x greater than or equal to zero, less than two pi. And that's always going to be the context here, unless I specifically say otherwise. If you assume when we're solving an equation like this that the angles we're finding are always between zero and two pi. So instead of doing this, I'm going to take the reciprocal of both sides. The reciprocal of secant is cosine. The reciprocal of negative one half. Oh, I did. I, I wrote my equation wrong. So this equation has no solutions. This equation has no solutions. Sorry about that. And cosine is never right. Remember the graph of cosine of x. Right, this is a very common fact people use a lot. Cosine of x is this, this kind of deal, and so on. Cosine of x is always between negative one and one. So cosine of x couldn't equal negative two. And I wrote the problem wrong. The problem is supposed to be secant of x equal to negative two. And then if you take the reciprocal of secant e cosine, reciprocal of negative two is negative one half. All right, so if I want to solve cosine x equal to negative one half, um, I will tell you there's a way to do so. Calculate the, you should be aware that there's a way to do this using a calculator. The way to do it using a calculator, well, kind of. If you do it using a calculator, you would write x equal to inverse cosine of negative one half. If you did that, if you're in radians, well, I should say, if you're in degrees, it would tell you that the answer was um, the inverse cosine of negative one half is. Sorry, let me think for a second. What is it? It is um, 120 degrees. Okay, that's all well and good. Um, if you were in radians, I'm curious now. If we're in radians, what do we get? So let's see, mode radians. I bet it's going to give us, well, actually, my calculator is kind of smart sometimes. It might give us 2 pi over 3. It might give us something that's approximately 2 point something. Let's find out. Inverse cosine of negative 1 half. On my calculator, yeah. So if you're in radians, so if I ask for the answer in radians, right? Inverse cosine would be approximately 2.094. That's not super helpful, right? We want it in radians, which would be 2 pi over 3. And 2 pi divided by 3 is approximately 2.094. So the reason I'm mentioning this is because if you were to do this, it's not going to be the full answer. Right? Yeah, inverse cosine of negative one half is 120 degrees or two pi over three radians. The problem is that there are multiple answers to this question, and the inverse cosine only gives you one of those answers. So we're going to solve this by thinking about the unit circle or maybe it's the quadrants. So I'm really going to ask myself, okay, where is cosine equal to positive one half? Well, I know the angle. What is x about equal to? It's approximately 2.094, but we shouldn't really concern ourselves with that. But, but yes, you're, it is about 2.094. So I want to know where is cosine equal to positive one half in the first column, meaning what's the reference angle? Well, the reference angle is pi over three. Right, pi over three, is the angle that if you take cosine of it, you get one half. But now I actually want cosine of x to equal negative one half. So I need to look for angles that are in quadrants two or three, because we know that cosine is positive in the first and the fourth quadrant, cosine is negative in the second and the third quadrant. So I'm looking for an angle in the second quadrant whose reference angle is pi over three. Oh, well that angle is two pi over three. 
I'm also looking for an angle in the third quadrant whose reference angle is pi over three. And that angle is going to be pi plus pi over three, which is going to be four pi over three. So the actual answers to this question, the solutions to this question are that x is equal to pi over, sorry, 2 pi over 3 in quadrant 2, and 4 pi over 3 in quadrant 3. In, rate, in degrees, your answer would be x equal to 120 degrees, 240 degrees. I will point out, though, while it's not wrong to do this, the question specifically does say that x is between 0 and 2 pi, meaning your answer is supposed to be in radians. So if someone writes this, they do want you to write your answer in radians. They will probably accept it in degrees, but they might not. So, um, let's see. Let's solve a couple more here. Let's solve a couple easy ones. Let's solve cosine of x equal to negative one. Okay. So this is one of the few examples where you don't have multiple answers. So if you're solving cosine x equal to negative one. There's only one place on the unit circle where cosine is equal to negative one. It's right there. Where the angle is pi. So the only solution here is x equal to pi. Now that's going to happen sometimes when the values are values that are associated with quadrantal angles. If you have an angle that's ending on one of the axes, Sometimes there's only going to be one solution. Specifically, like if cosine equals negative one, or if sine, right? If I was trying to solve, you know, like sine of x equal to negative one, um, my answer would be down here, right? It would be this angle, which is three pi over two, because that's the point of zero, negative one. So the angle would be three pi over two. So trying to send sine of x equal to zero on the other hand, then there's going to be a couple solutions, right? So I've got this point here. So there's a solution there where sine is equal to zero. So the angle there would be, sorry, sine x equal to zero. The angle there would be x equal to zero. And then also there, x equal to pi. So point out that you might be tempted to say that two pi is a solution. It's technically not because we're saying that our solutions are between zero up to two pi, but not including two pi. So we shouldn't include two pi because it's really kind of the same angle as zero. It's coterminal. Okay, well, let's look at solving some more complicated equations. Let's say I wanted to solve Mm, that seems less exciting. Sure, let's do this. I want to solve cosine squared x equal to cosine of x. Okay, so here's the wrong thing to do. The wrong thing to do is to divide by cosine. Why is it the wrong thing to do? Well, let's find out. We divide both sides by cosine. Cosine squared, in fact, let's write it out. So cosine squared x divided by cosine x equals cosine x divided by cosine x. Something squared divided by itself is just itself, right? Cosine squared divided by cosine is cosine. Cosine divided by cosine is one. And from, well, actually we didn't do one, but we can see the right over here, cosine is equal to one. So if we do this, we get the only answer being x equal to zero radians, which is true, right? Cosine of zero is one. You plug it in here, cosine of zero is one, one squared is one, cosine of zero is one, one equals one. The problem is we missed some solutions. So if you're going to, well, I should say you don't want to divide both sides by a trig function because you're going to lose solutions. Instead, what we always want to do when we're trying to solve equations like this 
is we want to bring everything to one side. So it's equal to zero. So we get cosine squared x minus cosine x equal to zero. And then we can factor out a cosine of x from the two. So you have cosine of x times cosine of x minus one equal to zero. And then, yes, we definitely want this part equal to zero. So that cosine x equals one, so that x equals zero. But we also want this part to be zero. And cosine is zero. Let's see, cosine is zero both at the top at the angle pi over two and at the bottom at the angle three pi over two. So the other solutions we get are going to be x equal to pi over two and x equal to three pi over two. So doing it this way, we missed two of the three solutions. That's no good. So we never really want to divide by a trig function when we're trying to solve these trigonometric equations. We want to bring everything to one side and see if we can factor. Um, yeah, let's look at some more. Let's say we have, I'm gonna change that. I'm gonna change that too. Let's say we have tangent squared x equal to three. Okay, you can square root both sides here. That would be okay. You can write this as tangent of x equal to plus or minus the square root. Alternatively, just to kind of go with the theme of bringing everything to one side and factoring, you technically could bring everything to the left and factor. You could write this as tangent squared x minus three, hold on the parentheses, zero. And then you can factor this as tangent of x minus the square root of three times tangent of x plus the square root of three. And so you end up getting tangent of x equals the square root of three and tangent of x equal to the negative square root of three. Exactly like we did over here. We bring the trade in the sheet for the final. Um, I'll have to think about that. I don't have a clear answer on that right now. I think my answer is probably going to be something along the lines of, I will give you the ones that you might need that I don't, I'll give you the ones that I don't expect you to memorize that you might need, but I'll have to kind of give a little more thought to that as far as what I, what I think you should memorize and what I think you should be given. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'll, have to, I'll have to give more thought to that, Paula. It's a fair question, though. I will definitely write myself a note so I don't forget. 16, trade enemies for final. Okay, we'll see. I'll, I'll think. The final is going to take them. So, yeah, I, I, that, I mean, it does kind of say, like, I, if I didn't provide them, that's I wouldn't really be able to stop you from looking them up. Um, so I would encourage, so what I've done in the past as far as the unit circle is I've given everyone a blank unit circle that they can fill out. And again, right, it's kind of different times. So I don't know, I'll have to kind of, I'll have to kind of think about what makes sense. Um, all right, so solving this equation, we're going to be looking for where the reference angle where tangent is equal to the square root of three. Um, is it pi over six or pi over three? I don't know, let's draw the triangle. Here's my 30, 60, 90 right triangle. And I know that the smallest angle is opposite the smallest side, the biggest angle is opposite the biggest side, and the medium angle is opposite the medium side. So tangent is, from this angle, tangent is opposite over adjacent. So the angle I'm looking for is 60 degrees, also known as pi over three radians. Okay, but I need tangent to be positive or negative three, which means I actually want the angle to be in every quadrant, right? I'm gonna say, well, I can have 
right? Reference angle of pi over three in quadrant one or in quadrant two or in quadrant three or in quadrant four. So in quadrant one, that's going to be pi over three. In quadrant two, that's going to be two pi over three. In quadrant three, that's going to be four pi over three, right? Because three pi over three is just pi. In quadrant four, that's going to be five pi over three. So my answers here, there are four of them. X equal to pi over three, two pi over three, four pi over three, five pi over three. Um, uh, James, can you explain one more time how you got the reference angle? Sure. So there's a couple of different ways to think about it. Um, sorry, I'm trying to look at that pen here and see what's going on. It's terrible. Sure. Um, what, the way I did it here was I said, well, I know for the square root of three, the square root of three shows up in the 30, 60, 90 triangle. So I drew the 30, 60, 90 triangle. And then I know that for the 30 degree angle, the opposite side is the smallest side. For the 90 degree angle, the opposite side is the biggest side. And for the 60 degree angle, which is the medium angle, the opposite side is the medium length side, which is square root of three. And then I said, okay, in this triangle, which angle can I take tangent of to get, to, to get root three? Well, tangent of 30 is one over root three. That's not what I want. Tangent of 60 is root three over one. That's what I want. So tangent of 60 degrees is square root of three, but then I changed it back to radians. And I know that 60 degrees is pi over three radians. Thank you. Another way to do it would just be to kind of remember that tangent of pi over three is equal to root three, right? That's another option, but I kind of like to think about what's happening here. Um, <clears throat> and then we did get an answer in every quadrant because tangent could be positive or negative. And that's typical. When you're trying to solve something and you have like something squared equal to a number, you often are going to get that you have solutions in every quadrant. Here's another example of that. Um, let's say I want to solve, sure. Yeah, that's fine. Let's do that one. Let's say I want to solve four sine squared x minus one equals zero. Um, there are two valid ways you could go here. So when I see this, I see a difference of squares. I see two sine quantity squared minus one quantity squared. So you could factor this as two sine x minus one times two sine x plus one. And, and then you can say, okay, well, here I want two sine x minus one to equal zero. So two sine of x equals one. So sine of x equals one half. And here you're gonna get two sine of x plus one equals zero. 2 sine of x equals negative 1, sine of x equals negative 1. Or you could do the thing where you isolate. If you've got a trig function squared, it is okay to isolate it and then square root both sides. So you can say, well, I've got 4 sine squared x equal to positive 1, and then divide both sides by 4, and then take the square root of both sides. So sine of x is plus or minus the square root of one fourth. But the square root of one is one and the square root of four is two. So this is sine of x equals plus or minus one half, which is the same thing we've got there. So either way you want to approach this is fine. Do whatever seems to make the most sense to you. Um, so then we have to figure out what the answer is, or I should say the answers are. Again, in one full period, right? X is between zero, and two pi. So to do that, we are going to again find the reference angle. So what's the angle? Or what's the reference angle where sine of x is equal to one half? Is it pi over three or is it pi over six? If I can go back to my triangle on the other side here, I can see that sine of this angle is opposite of hypotenuse. So sine of 30 degrees is one half, or sine of pi over six radians is one half. The reference angle is pi over six. But then I need an answer in every quadrant because sine can be positive in quadrants one and two, and sine can be negative in quadrants three and four. So I'm looking for the angles whose reference angles are pi over six 
in each of the four quadrants. Right, so this first angle right, is pi over six. And then this next angle is pi minus pi over six, which is five pi over six. And then this next angle is pi plus pi over six, which is seven pi over six. And this final angle is two pi minus pi over six, which is 11 pi over six or all the usual angles that have a reference angle of pi over six. And the answer is the four answers, pi over six, five pi over six, seven pi over six, 11 pi over six. Or as I like to think about it, if you're finding all the angles that have the same reference angle in each of the quadrants, it's all of the same denominators and the fraction can't reduce. Right. Any other angle, 2 pi over 6, 3 pi over 6, 4 pi over 6, all those would reduce to something else. Um, 5 doesn't, 6 pi over 6 would reduce to pi. 7 doesn't, 8 pi over 6, 9 pi over 6, 10 pi over 6 all reduce. 11 pi over 6 doesn't. So if you're trying to find all of the angles in one revolution that have the same reference angle, it's just all the angles that have the same denominator and the numerator doesn't reduce. Always works. It's kind of cool. Okay, let's do one or two more, and then we will then we'll talk about graphing sine cosine. Mm, let me give you let's let's do a, a hard-ish one. Sure. Let's see. Um, I saw something. Like, there's something. Blur. Okay. Let's say I have two cosine squared of x. Oh, let's see. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm trying to take the hat off. F, sure. Um, plus cosine x minus one equals zero. Let me make sure, let me make sure that makes sense here. Yeah, oh, okay. I think I want it to be a minus with our next step. Sure. Okay, so for a problem like this, kind of looks quadratic, right? It kind of looks like if you replace cosine with some other variable like u, we said u equals cosine of x for a second. And we could write this as 2u squared minus u minus 1 equals 0. And this does factor. This factors as I need a 2u and a u. And I need to multiply the negative one. So it's either going to be a minus one and a plus one like this, but that's wrong. Because you get minus u plus 2u, which is going to give you a plus u, and I wanted the minus u. So it's actually going to be plus one to minus one like that. Because then it multiplies that correctly. I get 2u squared. I get plus u minus 2u gives me a minus u. I get minus 1. So then I can go back and replace what you actually did and say, oh, this is going to be this is going to be 2 cosine x plus 1 times cosine x minus 1. So then we're going to set each of the factors equal to zero. So we're going to get two cosine x plus one equal to zero. So that's going to give me two cosine x equal to negative one. Cosine x equal to negative one half. And then we also have this one. Cosine x minus one equals zero. Cosine x equals one. So we have to solve these. Okay, so for cosine x equal to one, well, that's not terrible. That's just this bottom name of the circle. So the solution to that is going to be x equal to zero, zero radians, or zero degrees would also be technically appropriate. And then for cosine x equal to negative one half, again, I'm looking for the angle that it cosine of the angle is equal to positive one half. So I know that 
cosine of pi over three is positive one half. So I'm looking for the angles in quadrants two and three where the reference angle is pi over three. The reference angle is pi over three. And I'm saying, okay, I want to be in quadrant two and quadrant three. So in quadrant two, the angle is two pi over three. Because then if you add pi over three, you get the pi. In quadrant y positive. So because I'm always doing so always positive, right? When I'm looking for the reference angle, I'm always looking for the angle in quadrant one, which means the value is going to be positive, right? I'm saying cosine of what angle in quadrant one equals positive one half because all the angles in quadrant one have positive trig function expressions. Um, so I'm saying, okay, I'm going to say cosine of pi over three is equal to positive one half. And then I know that in the other quadrants, like quadrant two and quadrant three, cosine of this angle, which has pi over three as a reference angle, is going to be equal to negative one half. So right, x equal to two pi over three. Cosine of two pi over three is negative one half. And then in quadrant three, right, the angle needs to be pi plus pi over three, which is four pi over three. So those are the angles there because cosine of two pi over three is negative one half. Cosine of four pi over three is negative one half. But we use the fact that cosine of one pi over three is equal to positive one half to figure out what these other angles with the same reference angle of the other quadrants are. Okay. Um, do I have one more? Let me see. Um, James? Yeah. So would our three answers be two pi over three, four pi over three, and then zero? Correct. Okay. Let me do one more of a similar nature. Uh, I'm going to change it up a tiny bit. Let's see. I want to do. Sorry, where'd you go? Uh, let's say we have. Um... Sure, this will be easier. Cosecant squared x plus cosecant x equal to two. Two? Is that what I want? Yeah, sure, why not? Okay, so just like when we're solving anything else, right, when we're solving trig equations, we almost always want to bring everything to one side and have zero on the other side. There are, there are the exceptions if you just have something squared equal to a number, you can totally square both sides. But here I definitely want cosecant squared x plus cosecant x minus two equal to zero. And I'm just going to factor it, right? Because again, this is a quadratic thing. Something squared plus something minus two. So I'm looking for things that multiply the negative two and add up the positive one. So I'm going to have cosecant of x cosecant of x to multiply to cosecant squared. And then I need to multiply the negative two and add up the positive one. So I need a plus two and a minus one. So I'm looking here for cosecant of x to be plus two to equal zero. So cosecant of x to equal negative two. Or I would prefer to think of this as sine of x equal to negative one half. Similarly here, I've got cosecant of x minus one equal to zero, cosecant of x equal to one, and then take the reciprocal of both sides and say, oh, sine of x equal to the reciprocal of one is one. Okay, so now I want to find the angles that solve this. So sine of x equal to one, that's just going to be the angle up here. So pi over two. Sine of x equal to negative one half, there are going to be answers in a couple of quadrants, specifically the third and fourth quadrant, because that's where sine is negative. But again, to kind of address Alessandra's question from last time again, I'm going to look for where sine of x is equal to positive one half so I can find the angle that's the reference angle and then use that reference angle to find the correct angles in quadrants three and four. 
So my reference angle, I'm going to find by setting sine of x equal to positive one half. And then we know that the reference angle, sorry, the, yeah, the angle there is going to be pi over six or 30 degrees. And then I'm actually looking for the angle, well, I want sine to be negative, which is in quadrant three and in quadrant four. So I need to go pi plus pi over six. So pi plus pi over six is going to be seven pi over six. And then I need to go two pi minus pi over six to get 11 pi over six. And those are my three answers, pi over two, seven pi over six, and 11 pi over six. Okay. So I think I've said enough about solving for equations. Let's go ahead and talk about graphing sine and cosines and more. So I want to graph sine and cosine, and I'm going to include now a horizontal shift. Let's say I want to graph y equal to 3 sine of x plus pi over 6 plus 1. So I'm going to write down all the things. You know, the amplitude is 3. The vertical shift is 1, right? meaning my new midline is going to be 1. So when I, I'm, gonna, I'm, not even, I'm not even close to the I'm going to start graphing this just so I, can, so I can show you my thought process, right? I'm going to say, well, I know that I'm going to be, my middle is y equal to 1. And I'm going to go 3 above and 3 below. So I know that the five important points that I'm going to find are going to be either at a height of 1 or 4 or negative 2. Those are the only y values we really care about here. The middle, the top, and the bottom. Even though the sine function takes on literally every value between, in this case, negative two and four, we only care about the ones that are negative two, one, and positive four. Okay. If I didn't have this phase shift or this horizontal shift, it would just be the usual, you know, break, go, go to two pi, break it up into the four quarters, right? Pi pi over two, three pi over two, and then sine would start at the middle and then go to the top and then back to the middle and then to the bottom and then back to the middle. So this graph here is not the graph that I want. This is the graph of, this is y equal to three sine of x plus one. So now I'm gonna do the phase shift. I'm going to move everything pi over six to the left. Now, here's the way I think about my horizontal shift. Now, I know you guys are pretty well versed in this. Um, we know that when we add on the inside, we're going to move to the left. We subtract from the inside, we move to the right. But it's going to be a little more complicated if we have a different coefficient of x here. So here's the really easy way to figure out what your phase shift is or your horizontal shift. Set the inside of the trig function. We'll set the inside of the trig function, meaning we set the angle, right? Our angle that we're taking sine of is x plus pi over six. Set that equal to zero. Because usually, right, for this function here, when I'm graphing three sine of x plus one, I'm usually starting at the angle zero. I still want to start at the angle zero. So I'm going to say, well, I'm going to start at x plus pi over 6 equal to 0, which is going to give me x equal to negative pi over 6. So that's going to be my actual starting place. Um, it's about right there. OK. But here's the thing. Now I need to shift all of my other points, pi over 6 to the left as well. Here's the way that I have found to do it that I think is the most straightforward. Here's my new starting point. I still want one full period. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my starting point. So that's my first important x value. 
usually, right, I would start at zero and then I'd add one quarter, which is pi over two, add another quarter to get pi over two plus pi over two, which is pi, add another quarter of my period, you get pi plus pi over two, which is three pi over two, add another quarter of my period, you get three pi over two plus pi over two, which is two pi, which is four pi over two, which is two pi. But now I'm starting pi over six to the left at negative pi over six. But I'm still going to say, well, my period is still good old two pi. And a quarter of my period is two pi divided by four, which is one, one half of pi or pi over two. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my new starting point and add a quarter of my period four times. So my first point is gonna be negative pi over six. My second point is gonna be negative pi over six plus a quarter of the period, which is pi over two. To add those fractions together, I need the common denominator. That's going to be negative pi over 6 plus 3 pi over 6, which is 2 pi over 6. I could reduce that, but I'm not going to. My next point is going to be, so I, let me actually graph this. So, right, so I've got, so let me make this up right here. So, so there's my new, right, x2. There's my 2 pi over 6. Again, it's just this point shifted back the same amount. So then, to, so, and again, I really should say, right, this distance here, that is one quarter of my period. Okay, so now to find the next point, I'm gonna take this X value and I'm gonna add on another quarter of my period to get to the next important point. So a quarter of my period is still pi over two or three pi over six. So I'm gonna take my previous point of two pi over six and add on one quarter of my period, which is three pi over six. Two pi over six plus three pi over six is five pi over six. So that's this point here, five pi over six. And then I'm gonna do that two more times. I'm gonna add another quarter of my period to get the point here, and another part of my period to get the point here. So, right, the, the fourth point is the previous point, five pi over six, plus one quarter of my period, which is three pi over six. Because, so the reason I'm adding pi over two is because pi over two is one quarter of my period, which is two pi, right? So again, a full revolution, is two pi. One quarter of that is pi over two. Uh, five pi over six plus three pi over six is eight pi over six. That's this point here. And again, right, that length is one quarter of my period. And finally, the last point, x5, is the previous point plus again, one quarter of my period. 8 pi over 6 plus pi over 2, which is 3 pi over 6, gets me 11 pi over 6. That's this last point here. So my actual graph is instead of being this green one, is going to be this one that starts. So my first point's here. I'm going to start at the middle. The sign starts at the middle. So the reason I'm adding three pi over six every time is because I'm adding pi over two every time. But I see that my denominator is six. So I'm just trying to make my life easier and say, oh, I'm just going to add three pi over six instead of adding pi over two. Um, aren't supposed to add two pi over six or two pi over six? Cool, cool. Okay, okay. All right, cool. So, so just to back up to kind of say everything, whatever the period is, whether it's two pi or something different, if it's a different period, I'm gonna add a quarter of that period four times to get a whole period, right? Four quarters makes a whole thing. I start with my initial value, my starting point, and then to that value, I add the quarter of a period one, two, three, four times. The last two values, so I don't usually write them on my x-axis because it gets kind of messy. My last two values were eight pi over six and 11 pi over six. And notice that from negative pi over six to 11 pi over six, 11 pi over six minus negative pi over six is 12 pi over six, which is two pi, which is exactly the length 
of my period. So then sine starts in the middle, and then the next important point goes to the top, and then the next important point is back at the middle, and then the next important point is down at the bottom, and then the next important point is back in the middle. So all of my important points just got shifted the same amount to the left. So it's literally a phase shift of the sine function, right? It all got shifted that same amount to the left. Okay, let's look at a, one or two more examples. Yeah, let's look at this one. Okay, so yeah, this one should be fine. Actually, I should stop. Are there questions? Are there any more questions about this one before we do another example? I had a quick question. Yeah, go ahead. Purring into the background. She's right next to me. Um, how exactly are you finding like the period? So, so in general, the period is always two pi, I should say for sine and cosine and secant and cosecant, but not tangent and cotangent. For sine and cosine, the period is two pi divided by the coefficient of x. In this case, the coefficient of x is just one. So two pi divided by one is just two pi. Okay, thank you. Um, in this next example, the period is gonna be different. Let's look at this next example. So the next example is going to be y equal to two. I don't want to use. Uh, I'm going to use a different number in front just to avoid any confusion. It's going to be three cosine of two x minus pi over three minus one. Okay. So again, like in the previous example, our amplitude is still three. Our vertical shift, which I'm just thinking of the new middle, our vertical shift, which is the new middle, is going to be negative one, so down one. Um, what's the period going to be here? Well, normally the period's two pi, but the period is going to be two pi divided by what? Three, two, negative one, negative pi over three. Divided by the coefficient of x. The reason for that is you want your angle to get a full period's worth. Well, if your angle is just x, x has to go from zero to two pi to get a full period, right? Because the period is two pi, right? One full revolution around the unit circle. But if your angle has a two x, the next only has to go from zero to pi for two times x to go from two times zero to two times pi, which is zero to two pi. So that's why we do this because x doesn't have to be as big for the values here to be, to be as big as we need them to be to get a full revolution. Okay. Um, so if we start thinking about the graph of this before I do the rest of the stuff, right, we know that we are going to be down one. And we're going to have an amplitude of three. So we're going to go as much as three above, right? And that's a negative one there, sorry. Right, so we're going to go as much as three above negative one, negative one plus three is two, and three below, which is negative four. Okay. Um, so in this case, one quarter of my period is my period divided by four. So my period divided by four is pi over four. The only other thing we have to do now is find the starting place. So I want to be very, very explicit here. The shift is not pi over three to the right. If it was x minus pi over three, sure it would be. Since we have two x minus pi over three, some people would have you like factor out a two from the inside here and write this as cosine of two times x minus something else, it's too much work. The really the most straightforward way to find the phase shift is to say, or the starting point, right? I'm gonna start this where the angle, all the stuff in the cosine function is equal to zero, 
right? We usually start cosine and sine in all of our trig functions, maybe tangent and exception. But we almost always start by looking at what's happening when the angle is zero. Okay, well, I'm setting the angle equal to zero. Now I have to solve for x. So 2x equals pi over 3, and dividing both sides by 2 or multiplying both sides by 1 half, 1 half times 2x equals 1 half times pi over 3. And 1 half times 2x is x. 1 half times pi over 3 is pi over 6. So my horizontal shift or my phase shift is pi over 6 to the right, right? Because it's a positive horizontal shift. I'm going to be starting like right there, pi over 6. So my first point before I do anything else, I know my first point is going to be up here. Because at my first important x value, we know that cosine starts at the top, right? Not the middle, not the bottom, but the top. Okay, now we have to find the other four x values that are all a quarter of a period from each other. So I'm going to take this pi over six, my first, my starting point, and I'm going to add one quarter of a period, which is that much, right? In the previous problem, one quarter of my period was pi over two. But now since my period is smaller, my period now is pi, one quarter of my period is one fourth of pi or pi over four. So this is my first point, pi over six. My second point is going to be that point pi over six plus one quarter of my period, which is pi over four. I need a common denominator. Then I'm gonna get two pi over 12 plus three pi over 12 which is going to give me 5 pi over 12. So my next point maybe is that right there. So there's 5 pi over 12. And we know that the, the next point cosine goes from the top to the middle. Why 3 pi over 12? Because I have the only way I can add fractions is by getting a common denominator. And 6 and 4 both have 12 as a least common multiple. So I multiply this by two over two and this by three over three. Okay, so now I know that when I'm adding pi over four, instead of just adding pi over four to get the next one, I'm gonna be smart and I'm gonna add the thing that already has the common denominator, which is three pi over 12. So to get my next point, x three, it's gonna be this previous point, five pi over 12 plus again, one quarter of my period, which is three pi over 12. Sorry, I wrote 13 there, sorry about that. Five pi over 12 plus three pi over 12 is eight pi over 12. So that's gonna be, so the next point, and again, these all should be the same length from each other. That point there, that's eight pi over 12. Okay, so I'll find the last two. The next one is gonna be the previous one, eight pi over 12 plus, one quarter of my period, which is three pi over 12. Eight plus three is 11. So I get 11 pi over 12. And finally, the last point, the fifth one is the previous one. Oh, sorry, that's gonna be, you know, right there. And then the next one is gonna be the previous one, 11 pi over 12, plus my one quarter of my period, which is three pi over 12, which gives me 14 pi over 12. Okay, so I want to say, I know we're about out of time here, but I want to say a couple words. We find the starting place. And then from that starting place, we add one quarter of our period, another quarter of our period, another quarter of our period, another quarter of our period, so that we added four whole quarters of the period to make one whole period of the graph. But the reason we're picking these points in particular is because they're the points where we have the nice highs and the lows. Right? If you plug in pi over 6, 2 times pi over 6 is pi over 3. Pi over 3 minus pi over 3 is 0. We know that cosine of 0 is 1. So then 3 times 1 minus 1 is going to give you that high point of 2. And then right, if, you do, if, if you do not have a negative 1 or any number, the line would be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you don't have this minus one here, yeah, your middle line would be the horizontal axis, yes. Um, and so then right, we know that cosine at the one, two, three, four, five important points does top, 
middle, bottom, middle, top. So I'm going to go two, and then the next point, a value of negative one, and then the next point, a value of negative four, and then the next point, a value of negative one, and then the final point, a value of positive two. So here's what my graph looks like. How do I look? My, my lowest is negative four because of the middle line being negative one and the amplitude being three. The amplitude tells us how far above and how far below the middle line we go. So this is the technique I use for graphing sine and cosine when it's been shifted like this. I find if it shifts up or down, what the amplitude is to tell me how far above that shift and how far below that shift we go. And then I find my period. I find a quarter of my period. I find my starting place by setting the inside equal to zero. And then from that starting place, I add the period. Sorry, I add, well, I do add the period, but I add a quarter of the period, one, two, three, four times. So add a quarter of the period, add a quarter of the period, add a quarter of the period, add a quarter of the period to get one full period. Um.